and I guarantee you, you'll want to stay there. Yeah. It is, I've always said it is a not so hidden gem here in Faribault. It's on Faribault's east side, and we are delighted to have with us this morning education coordinator for Riverbend, Caitlin Moeller. Yes, thanks for inviting me today. I appreciate it. Yeah. We're going to have a special program today. I know you got Bird Fest coming up later this month. We'll talk all about it a bit later. Yes, it's going to be a great event, and if the weather stays this nice, it's going to be perfect. Are you a birder? I am. I wish I could learn more, but I'm just scratching the surface so far. You know, I was telling you before we hit the airways, my dad, in his elderly years, became a birder, which shocked me, to be honest. I mean, it just wasn't that way growing up. Yeah, it's pretty hard, all the different species, and they're so small, and learning all the calls, it's a very unique talent to possess. Yeah, we'd be walking along, you'd hear a bird, and he'd tell you what it was. I wish I could. I'm not that great yet. Someday I'll get there. Uh, uh, that's something maybe to look forward to. It is becoming more and more popular, birding, isn't it? All ages. Yes, a lot of young birders across the U.S. are getting into it because there's so many species to learn. And like I said, if you put a feeder in your backyard, you can always see backyard birds that are pretty easier to identify, and kids just love seeing those type of animals up close. And Riverbend is a birder's paradise. Yeah, we have 750 acres, and we've got such a diverse habitat types that it attracts birds of all sorts of different varieties, such as uh, waterfall, but then you also get those little songbirds as well and those big raptors. So it's a it's a great place to come and enjoy seeing the sights of birds. And then you get the prairie and the hardwood forest and the wetlands. Yep, and uh, all of our wetlands right now are pretty loud with frogs, but you can see uh, geese and ducks and all sorts of waterfall already taking advantage of those wetlands. So. Well, I'm glad to hear you're getting some frogs because they were not around for a while. Yeah, they're not doing so great uh, as a whole for the species just because of uh, pesticides and herbicides that are applied to the landscape. They absorb them through their skin. But at Riverbend, they're loud enough, and they're doing great right now. So, Fantastic. That's quite a sound at night, isn't it? It is. It's uh, pretty busy right now with chorus frogs. They're the first frogs to start calling in the spring. And then we just heard tree frogs and a couple species of toads that are calling. Do you identify them from their call? Yep, yep, only the males make, make calls, but they uh, start early in the spring, right when it's warm enough to start making noise, trying to attract those females, so they're pretty loud. Where are you from, Caitlin? I'm actually from northeast Iowa. I'm from not the flat side, I guess. Uh, it's really hilly there, and I'm right next to the Mississippi, so there's lots of bluffs. So you're right in the northeastern corner? Yes, exactly. I'm about 20 minutes from the Mississippi River, bordering Wisconsin. Okay. I worked in Ottumwa, Iowa, for a few years. I've been through a tunnel. That's a good place, too. But uh, the town that I'm actually from is called Edgewood. It's got about 900 people. I now live in Northfield, which is also, it's, it's fun there, too. The tunnel was hilly, too. Yeah. In fact, I lived most of my time in a tunnel at the top of the hill. Yep, it's a lot better than the flat central part of Iowa, so. The thing I didn't like about it, the Wapalo River, you know, about the only thing you caught in the Wapalo River was catfish. Yep, I, I don't have an acquired taste for catfish or bullheads. They're not really my of choice yet, so maybe someday I'll get better at that. Well, smoked catfish is actually pretty good, but I didn't like catching them. Those whiskers are sharp. Yep, I'm a walleye fan through and through. Sounds like you perfect place, Minnesota. Yep, yep. I really start to enjoy the um, nature centers that are around, and River Bend we offer quite a bit, but also the areas that surrounding the Carlton Arb, the uh, near strand big woods. There's so many places for people to get out and enjoy those scenic places. You got the Carlton Arboretum. Mm hmm you got the Arboretum, Landscape Arboretum up in Jan Hansen area. Yep. All kinds of places in the metro area. Yep. Uh, one of the naturalists just ran the uh, 5K at the Arb, the Arboretum in, in the Twin Cities and said it was just beautiful there. And uh, all the trees are starting to shoot out leaves and buds and they're smelling great. So at the Arb, she said it smelled great. And the lilacs and the cherry trees and the apple trees, they're all starting to bloom out. So it's, it's getting to look very much like spring. There are a lot of things happening this month of May, and we're going to talk to Caitlin about all of those events, so stay tuned. You'll become educated about what's happening at Riverbend Nature Center. Uh, I guess today is Caitlin Muller. She's the education coordinator out of Riverbend. How long do you work there, Caitlin? Uh, I'll be there a year in June, so just started. You like it there? I do. I like it a lot. Well, that's good. Hopefully you'll stick around a while. Yep. As the education coordinator. So we should probably dive right in. I was looking on your website. Man, oh man, you got all kinds of stuff going on in May. Yeah, it's a busy time of year. Our school programs are starting to wrap up, and then we're going to dive right into summer camps and all of our other big programs and events. So it's getting really busy out there. Do you have a preference? Do you prefer working with the school kids? Or? Uh, I like a combination of them all. My group focuses 
generally the seniors because the other coordinator does more school programs, but I help out all the, all the time and events are my uh, area of expertise as well. So this last Saturday at a bagels and birds event, how'd that go? It went good. Uh, the weather was perfect, so a lot of birds were coming to the feeders, and then the public can come out and they can enjoy some coffee and bagels or juice and bagels and uh, look out our, we call it windows to the wild, and look at the bird, birds that come to the feeder. So there's quite a bit of species that come on in, such as like the cardinals and the blue jays and chickadees. So they seem quite a, quite a bit, and we have binoculars and field guides that they use too. Now I've been told that if you set up a bird feeder, you better keep it full. Yeah. Because otherwise they rely on it so if you keep it full and then they use it as a resource and then you kind of stop feeding them it could hurt that bird so definitely if you if you're feeding birds definitely keep the keep them full and then also consider a bird bath because those can really attract birds as well you can just get it just a on a structure you can buy from like the home depot or sears or something like that and fill it with water and you'll you'll really see how it attracts the birds they come on in there and they flap their wings in there and it, it's a just as good as bird feed so well i'll be darned my neighbor's got some uh, humming, uh, hummingbird feeder and a couple other feeders. Mm -hmm. uh, I just heard that the uh, Baltimore Orioles and the hummingbirds were spotted in the Twin Cities area. So they're for sure here somewhere. So yep, it's a good time of year to start getting out your hummingbird feeders. Uh, sugary water and sometimes red seems to attract the hummingbirds because it's their favorite flower. Is the red color. And also the Baltimore Oriole, you can get uh, fruit, like an orange. Cut it in half and put it on a dish outside and those will start attracting the Orioles as well. So they're very, very pretty birds to see and most most people really favor those birds. So Yeah, they're so colorful. <laughs> they are and they're really uh, unique because the hummingbirds are so quick and you really gotta have a good eye to see those guys, but they're flashy colors and same with the Orioles. They're big they're birds that have uh, orange or black coloration and they stick out too, so You know, I was in Tanzania, been there a couple of times in East Africa. Okay. You've been there? I've never been there, no. Oh, my words. The color in their birds. The orange and vivid yellow and green. Yeah, I, I wish I could go travel to see the birds. And the Galapagos Islands, they have some different bird uh, species as well. So, And same with the rainforest. They have such a wide array. We don't have quite that array in Minnesota, but we still get some pretty flashy migrants. We were told they have what, what we call a robin. They have a robin, too, with a red breast, but it's blue. It's not the same color as our robins. A different color face. That's interesting. Isn't that? Mm -hmm. I thought it was, too. In fact, one day, I just sat out in front of where I was staying and listened to the birds. Yeah, the different bird calls. They're very, very pretty. And, and this time of year, too, just because those males are starting to attract the females, and many birds have already had their first nest attempts, such as um, owls and bald eagles. They've already nested. Uh, so those birds are starting to make nests and attract those females and guard those eggs. Uh, we have the uh, Bluebird Recovery Program gave the Nature Center a whole bunch of bluebird houses. So we have them set up throughout our prairie and you can see multiple bluebird pairs uh, on their nesting structures starting to build nests there. So it's fun to, it's fun to watch those birds and th their calls are, again, beautiful as well. So if you get really good and can identify them by their call, it's, it's a fun sport to get into. This week, you have a bird hike. Is that right? Uh, not this week. And May 23rd is when we have our big bird fest event. Well, that's the bird fest, but I thought there was a bird hike before that coming up. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So for our seniors group, we have a, a it's called a lifelong learning. And basically, if you're a senior and you want to continue learning, learning around among peers, you can come to a class that's offered in the middle of the day, so good for retired seniors. And one of our uh, members his name is Tom Bovers. He's a very avid birder. He comes out to the Nature Center almost every day. Uh, he will show you the different types of birds. You can identify by sound and, s and sight, and he will show you the areas to look for them and the skills to make you an avid birder. So it's just a kind of a fun class to learn. It's a little bit of a hike, and it's going to occur on Wednesday, uh, May 6th. And the cost is $5 if you're a member and $3 if you're not a member, and it goes from 1 to 3 p.m. So it's going to involve a little bit of hiking, but you should see some very pretty birds. Pre-registration required. Yeah, we kind of like pre-registration just to know how many numbers we're going to be working with if we have supplies. Uh, it's it's recommended, but not necessarily required, but we do often like it if you can. You stay on the trail? Yep, we're going to be staying on the trail. We'll go around the north side of the Riverbend property, so near the Interpretive Center, but we might look in the wetland areas and we'll 
go down by the river and then up in the forest and through the prairie as well to see if we can see the different birds that prefer those different habitats. So you might want to bring along a cane or something? Yep, and hiking shoes and maybe a hat and uh, hopefully if the rain holds off, you know, maybe some sunscreen as well. Well, I didn't think about the rain. Yeah, I hope it holds off. And and the good thing about it being in May, the bugs aren't quite as bad yet. Uh, I oh, don't have yeah. already seen mosquitoes, but they're not quite as bothersome as they do get. So. But there are a lot of birds that eat those bugs. Yeah, that's why we want those birds to stay around. And same with those bats. So any of those things that can go around and grab those nuisance bugs like mosquitoes or gnats are always a favorite. I did read this morning that bats, beginning today, a couple species anyway, are on the endangered species list. Yeah, the um, white nose syndrome is affecting a lot of bats. Uh, basically, it's a fungus that grows on the tip of their nose when they're in hibernation in caves. And it's, it's uh, affecting a lot of the bat populations just basically throughout the U.S. So those bats, even though most people fear them, they're very, very valuable species because they can eat over a thousand mosquitoes in one night. And if you see a bat during the day, it's not, off, it's not bad. If there's a large hatch of insects, they will come out during the day to utilize that big population of insects. And they are so, so great at taking out those mosquitoes. They're better than any other species of birds we have at taking mosquitoes. So they are very, very valid. And, and generally, they won't affect you unless you have you know, holes in your house so they can get into your attic or something like that. We do have quite a bit of people call us in the winter saying, hey, I found a bat. What should I do? We often try to say, you know, that bat is in hibernation. So if you, if you throw them out in the winter right now, it will most likely die or something like that. So we really try to protect as many bats as we can see just because, like you said, there's so many that are declining in their population numbers. Yeah, I haven't seen, well, when I grew up, I grew up in Spring Valley, Minnesota, okay. which is south of Rochester, down okay. in southeastern Minnesota. Okay. Bats galore. I mean, there's caves all over down in that area. Yeah. And so there, are, there were a lot of bats. You don't see them much anymore. No, they're just not as, not as common as they used to be. And, and especially if you do see those caves during those hibernation periods, you know, really late fall, early spring, most people ask that you do stay out of those caves because there's probably roosting bats in there and we don't want to we don't want to startle them and bring them out of hibernation early and some people often just think they go in caves but they can utilize any structures such as like a shade bark hickory tree sometimes they'll roost under that big shaggy bark or like i said in your barn or your attic or something like that anywhere they can find shelter is where they'll go yeah well they can even do it right i got hit in the head by a bat once walking in the front door of a store in Cannon Falls, right downtown Cannon Falls. I, di I didn't see the bat. I opened the door and boom, it hit me in the head. <laughs> Interesting. When I was little, we had a bat house along the side of our, our house, and there was quite a few bats that would utilize that too, and they're just interesting species to look at. So They're not going to, I mean, vampire, you know, the vampire bats is what yep. people are probably scared of. We actually don't have any bats that uh, drink blood. There are some in the uh, in the tropical areas, but they most often feed on livestock. So you're safe here. It's most often fruit or insects. So, so we're learning more about bats today. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons, now you mentioned the white nose syndrome, but uh, are pesticides a factor in the bat population too? Uh, pesticides often you know, change the dynamics of the insect population, so they could be changing where they normally hunt as well. I don't know the exact effect on pesticides or herbicides on bats. I'm unclear on that one. Okay. Let's see, what else is coming up? I broke some of these events down. You got uh, some sort of an edibles event, a hike coming up on May 9th? Yeah, we're really excited about that. One of our naturalists is very, very good at identifying wildlife ephemerals, or sorry, spring ephemerals which are just basically wildflowers that occur in the forest. And she's also very good at foraging, so she can identify edible plants. So what she's going to be doing here uh, on Sunday, on May 9th, from 1 to 3 p.m., you, it's, any ages are welcome to come, but she's going to take you on a wildflower hike. The Nature Center is just beautiful right now with so many different color variations of small flowers that are occurring. And they're not going to stick around much longer because the forest the trees are starting to bud out and produce their leaves, which will shade the forest floor, and there'll be no no sunlight for those wildflowers. So right now, they're growing really well, and there's so many different varieties. And then she's also going to teach you which plants that you can pick and eat. So she's going to probably get off a few recipe cards and such like that. But it's 
It is really cool to learn those different uh, techniques for gathering and eating wild edibles. That's on Saturday, right? May 9th? Oh, sorry. Saturday, May 9th from 1 to 3 p.m. Yeah, that's okay. Mother's Day is? Sunday. Yeah. May 10th. Yes. And you have a special event coming up on May 11th in honor of mo mothers called Animal Moms. Yeah, so I thought that would be kind of a fun program. I've done it before back at my previous places of employment, and everybody seemed to love it. So basically, we are in... Since Mother's Day is on May 10th, we're going to learn the day after about the steps that animal moms take to protect and feed and raise their young. So we'll learn about all the animals in the animal kingdom and what their moms do to teach their babies how to find food, how to protect themselves, and how to survive. So if the weather's nice, we're going to probably head outside to hunt and find those locations where those animal mothers are getting ready for their young and possibly even see some, um, some young animals. I just seen a, a baby fox the other day, and I seen a few baby raccoons couple of squirrels and then like I said all the birds are starting up too so it's going to be really fun to learn about what other species do to raise their young. We had too many squirrels in our neighborhood last year. Yep squirrels are kind of like rabbits if you remove them from their range there's just going to be another squirrel or another rabbit that comes in and takes their spot so they're very very successful at reproducing. Doggone we had uh, scores of them in fact my neighbor live trapped them and took them out to Riverbend. Yep, I've definitely heard of that quite a bit, but like I said, even if you move them, there's going to be another squirrel that comes in and takes that range, or another rabbit, so they, uh, they'll they pretty much capsize on anything that's available, any food resource, so. So they don't mark their territory or anything like that? They will, but then if you remove one or one happens to die, like I said, they'll just come in and a new one will take over, so. So what do you suggest? I mean, how do we get rid of an abundance of squirrels? Mm -hmm. I honestly have never seen a successful method of doing such. Um, <laughs> if you could go to extreme metho methods maybe and remove all the um, mass producing acorn trees or something like that in your yard or the walnut trees, you could try something like that. But uh, I've heard lots of people attempting to remove them, but nobody's been pretty successful. So. Yeah, well, that's part of the problem. I got a walnut tree in my yard. Yep. They love them babies. They do. Walnut trees and uh, maple trees that produce acorns, or oak trees that produce yeah. acorns. And any place you might have a little hole in a tree, they'll just crawl right in there and start stashing away their, their nuts, so. Well, what drives me crazy is they break them on my deck and they leave black stains all over my deck. Yeah, those walnuts, they can really, they can stain your hands, they can stain your clothes, and they, uh, they happen to, the chemicals they produce, you, you don't see much vegetation grow under a walnut tree very often either. They're pretty interesting trees. Do they stain the paws of the squirrels? I don't know. I've never been that close to a squirrel to find out, I guess, but I would assume they do for a little while. <laughs> I wonder how they get rid of that. I don't know. I'll have to ask one next time I see it. Yeah. Our guest this morning here on AM Minnesota is Education Coordinator for Riverbend Nature Center, Caitlin Muller, going over all the things that are going on at the Riverbend, which is on Faribault's east side, this month. Uh, Owls, older, wiser, livelier, seniors event comes up on May 20th. That's a Wednesday from noon until 2. Yep, uh, we started these uh, Owl senior events, and they're very, very popular. They're luncheon programs where you can come, you enjoy lunch, and then it's followed by a program of a natural history topic of some sort. So the program is catered in uh, by Hy-Vee, and uh, it's uh, just a couple-hour program. It starts around noon. And then the one that we have on May 20th is Scott Mackentham. He's from the Waterville Fish Hatchery, and he's the TNR Fisheries Supervisor there. He's going to present about the different fisheries uh, and the emerging threats to the fish that occur in these areas. So the title for that presentation is called Scales and Fins of Minnesota Fishes. So it should be really cool. We've never had anybody from the Fisheries DNR Bureau uh, come before and present about the fish, but I know a lot of seniors enjoy fishing, so it should be a should be a good program to learn a bit more about what occurs in your rivers. In fact, when I saw that, you reminded me I need I should try and get Scott on this show this week with a fishing opener this weekend. That would be perfect timing. Yep, he's a great guy. He just uh, wrote an article for the Minnesota Conservation Volunteer Magazine. He had a big article in there about catfish, actually. So. He's a, he's a good guy and a good presenter, so we're excited to have him. Yeah, we'll have to see if we can't get him on the show. Wednesday, May 20th, it's the Restoration Club. People can get involved with that. Yeah, uh, we just started that last year, and basically you can come to the Nature Center, and we'll teach you restoration techniques, and we'll teach you how to do them on the Riverbend property, and the theory is that you could bring 
those skills and techniques back home, and then you could apply them on your landscape. So we deal with things such as um, buckthorn, which is an invasive tree species. It's very aggressive. It grows a lot, quite at the Nature Center. And then garlic mustard, which we just found, unfortunately, at the Nature Center. So we're teaching people how to how to manage those invasive species, and it's kind of a lot of hands-on, more um, working aspect to it, but it's a lot of fun to learn different tips and techniques for identifying those species. Did you say garlic mustard? Garlic mustard, and if you like pesto, that's the exact same stuff they used for pesto. So it's a, it's a species that if you break the leaf, it literally smells like garlic. It's pretty aggressive. It takes over the whole understory. It's a small green plant, and it can it can take over take over an area. It's, in my opinion, quite a bit more aggressive than buckthorn. Do you have any idea why it's invaded the area? Uh, it was brought in probably from the bottom of somebody's shoe. There's a new initiative, I think it's called Play, Queen, Play Green Grow or something like that. Uh, it's trying to get you to brush off the bottom of your shoes every time you go from park to park. Because let's say you go over to a mere strand and you pick up garlic mustard on the bottom of your tread of your shoe and then you come to the nature center and then you're walking on a trail and those seeds fall off your shoe, they're going to start growing. So where we found garlic mustard is all around along the trout lily trail. So it was probably brought in from foot traffic on the human shoe. I never thought of that, but you know, I just recently returned from Italy. Obviously the shoes I've been wearing, I've walked on the soil in Italy with. Same with Tanzania or wherever you go. Yep, it just h hatches a ride right on your shoe and then comes on over. <coughs> That's why um, most state parks are implementing a boot brush system at their park kind of by their interpretive center so you can brush off your shoes before you leave and bring it to another park. You doing that here? Uh, we just got the uh, information to do so, so we're considering implementing those boot brushes and we already have those small hand brushes that we're using on the bottom of our shoes when we go into those garlic mustard areas. Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. River Bend, the big event this month is Bird Fest. Bird Fest coming up on Saturday, May 23rd from 8 until noon. Yeah, we're really, really excited about this. Uh, we haven't done one before, but we are partnering with a couple from Northfield that are certified bird banders. So they're going to be coming, and they're uh, going to be at the Bird Fest, and the Minnesota Raptor Center is going to be at the Bird Fest, as well as some of our more experienced members. So how we're going to run it is uh, we're going to have a rotation system. So if you come in the morning at 8 o'clock, you will you will do a bird hike for a little bit and look at the Nature Center trails and see what you can identify with your binoculars or maybe by sound. And then you'll do a bird craft for a while and we're going to create uh, bird feeders out of recycled materials. And then you're going to head over to the bird banders. So what they do is they set up a large net kind of by our bird feeders and the birds will kind of fly into the net and then they'll drop into like a catch area. And you can take the birds out and they will probably give each kid or adult, whoever, whoever attends, a chance to hold on to that bird. So if you've ever wanted to get a chance to hold on to, let's say, maybe a black cat chicken or a cardinal, you might get that chance at the bird fest. And then um, the actual banding is a little small band that they put on the bird's foot, and it has a series of numbers on it. So if you're ever at the Nature Center, maybe at Bagels and Birds, and you're looking through binoculars and you see a small band on that bird's foot, that's probably what it was from, a bird banding event. So you'll also get a chance to possibly hold on to a bird. And following those rotations, the Minnesota Raptor Center is coming at 11 o'clock, and they'll do a presentation with their large birds of prey. So they'll bring things like bald, bald eagles, uh, red-winged hawks, um, or red-tailed hawks. And then they're going to do a presentation, an hour-long presentation, with their live birds. So you can attend the entire day, or you can attend just the raptor show. But it should be a really, really fun event. And like I said, if you're a novice birder, or if you're maybe just beginning, or very experienced. There's something for everyone at this event, so it should be a lot of fun, and it's on Memorial Weekend, so it's, if you're looking for a family fun event, that's that's the one to check out. Registration? Yep. Uh, again, it would be nice if people would consider pre-registering, but we don't require it. And if you're going to attend the entire day, it's $15. If you're a member, it's $12. And let's say you just want to attend the Raptor presentation from the Minnesota Raptor Center, you can do that, and it's going to be five dollars if you're a member and seven dollars if you're not a member but it's an all-day event so it should be a lot of fun and you'll get a lot out of it sounds like fun yeah it should it should be good and if you have one of you know maybe a grandparent or a kid that's interested in learning a bit more about birds they'll definitely do that at this event bird fest 
think this will be an annual event? I sure hope so. If it takes off, we're going to try it again. Oh, I like that tie in there. It takes off. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Takes off. Perfect. That was very good, Caitlin. Caitlin Muller is the education coordinator at Riverbend, and I'm sure you're not opposed to the idea of people who might have ideas for programming at Riverbend to come up with those ideas, right? Definitely. We're always looking for new ideas and new programs to try. So if you have something you may be interested in, or maybe you've seen something at a different park that you wish was closer to your town, just call the Nature Center, email us, or let us know, hey, I'm interested in this program, and we can definitely see what we can work out. How much is a membership? A membership, if you're a student or an individual, it's 25 and if you're a family, it's 35 And with that membership, you get uh, discounts to our programs, uh, discounts to our gift shop, and then a discount to purchasing things at Paddington Seed and Feed Store. Uh, they're actually sponsoring our BirdFest event as well. So there's quite a bit that comes in with the membership. And like I said, if, if you use the trails or if you want to get in on some of those programmings, it's it's a better deal to, to grab onto one of those memberships, and uh, especially if you're considering sending one of your children to uh, summer camps. It's also good to have a membership. Is there a senior membership? There is. It's that individual membership rate, $25. Okay. Yep. Right. Well, you can't go wrong there. Nope. And the family members, I'm going to go wrong there, yep. too. Thanks, Caitlin. Appreciate your coming in. Thanks for inviting me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, and thanks to Paddington for bringing us that bird fest. Yeah. I, I think it will take off. I really do. I hope so. So, I better fly on out of here. Boy, that was really bad. As Caitlin Moeller, Education Coordinator for Riverbend.